My first question is, you have called yourself a technology optimist. And we hear a lot sometimes of concerns about technologies. What makes you actually optimist? Well, first of all, Professor Schwab, uh, thank you for uh, having me here. It's a pleasure to be back. Um, what, what makes me a technology optimist? I think it's more how I got introduced to technology. Uh, growing up, I think I had to wait for a long time. I would hear about things, but I had to literally wait before I got my hands on uh, either a telephone or a television. And each thing, when it came into our household, you know, I, I discreetly remember how it changed our lives. Uh, you know, the television allowed me access to world news, football and cricket, which I'm passionate about. Um, so I always had this, uh, you know, first-hand experience of how gaining access to technology changes people's lives. Later on, I was inspired by the One Laptop Per Child project, uh, this goal to, to give $100 laptops to every child. They quite didn't get there, but I think it was a very inspiring goal and made a lot of progress in the industry. And later, we were able to you know, make progress with Android. Each year, we bring hundreds of millions of people, and they get access to computing for the first time. We do this with low-cost, affordable Chromebooks. And seeing the difference it makes in people's lives, I think, I think you know, gives me great hope uh, for the path ahead. Yeah. And more recently with AI, just, just in the last month alone, you know, we have uh, seen how AI can clearly help doctors better detect breast cancer with more accuracy. We just recently launched better rainfall prediction. Uh, over time, AI can play a role in climate change. So when you see these examples firsthand, um, you know, I'm clear-eyed about you know, the risks with technology, but the biggest risk uh, with AI may be failing to work on it and make more progress with it, because it can impact uh, billions of people. Yeah. But um, Sundar, you, you were, if I, if I look at what, what has happened in technology over the last, uh, I would even say, 30 years, so there was one big uh, breakthrough. It was actually when um, AlphaGo um, uh, was beating uh, Lee Zedol. I, I think we haven't really understood yet the implications of uh, this breakthrough. And now your company, uh, Google, is again at the forefront of another um, uh, revolution, which may have even more uh, consequences, positive or negative one. It's actually uh, the, the, um, what you just announced in uh, quantum computing. It's a breakthrough. And I, I have to say, um, it's very difficult to understand. I just know uh, it could have a tremendous implications. Can you explain what we can expect from quantum computing? And you are now the leader. You, you have made a big breakthrough. No, it's an extraordinarily important milestone. You know, last year we achieved something, what's, what's known in the field as quantum supremacy. Uh, it is when you can take quantum computers and they can do something which classical computers cannot. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I like the way you characterized it. It's as inspiring a milestone as the deep blue moment or AlphaGo uh, playing with Lace et al. To me, you know, nature at a fundamental level uh, works in a quantum way. You know, at a subatomic level, things can exist in many different states at the same time. Classical computers work in ones and zeros. So we know that's an imperfect way uh, to simulate nature. Nature works differently. So what's exciting about quantum computing and why we are so excited about the possibilities is It'll allow us to understand the world in a deeper way. We can simulate nature better. So that means simulating molecular structures. So maybe we can discover better drugs. Mm -hmm. Understanding climate in a deeper way so that we can predict weather patterns and tackle climate change. We can design better batteries. Nitrogen fixation, which is the process by which we make the world's fertilizers, accounts for 2% of carbon emissions. And the process hasn't changed in a long time because it's very complicated. Quantum computers one day allows us the hope that we can make that process more efficient. Yeah. So it's very profound. We've all been dealing in technology with the end of Moore's law. Uh, you know, it's re really revolutionized the past 40 years, but it's leveled off. So when I look at the future and say, how do we drive improvements? 
quantum would be one of the tools in our arsenal uh, by which we can keep something like Moore's Law continuing to evolve. So the potential is huge, and you know we'll have challenges. Yeah. You know, in a five to ten year time frame, quantum computing will break encryption as we know it today. But you know we can we can work around it. We need to do quantum encryption. Uh, so there are challenges, as always, with any evolving technology. But I think the combination of AI and quantum will help us tackle some of the biggest problems we see. And you add also, to a certain extent, genetics. I mean, I think uh, quantum computing and biology will... One of the uh, biggest potential. ...will have a great potential. Yeah. Positive and negative one. Uh, the positive one, as you're saying rightly, is, uh, you know, to simulate molecules, protein folding, et cetera, to, it's very, very complex today. We cannot do it with classical computers. So with quantum computers, yeah. we can. Yeah. Uh, but we have to be clear-eyed about, uh, you know, all these powerful technologies. And, uh, you know, this is why, you know, I think we need to be deliberate and regulate uh, uh, technologies like AI and as a society needs yeah. to need to engage on it. But that leads me to the next question actually because um, in an editorial in Financial Times which I read just before the annual meeting you stated and I quote Google's role starts with recognizing the need for a principled and regulated approach for applying artificial intelligence. What, what, what does it really mean? You know, I, I've said this before, AI is one of the most profound things we are working on humanity, uh, as humanity. It's more profound than fire or electricity or any of the other bigger things we have worked on. Uh, it has tremendous positive sides to it, but, you know, it has real negative consequences. You know, when you think about uh, technologies like facial recognition, it can be used to benefit. It can be used to find missing people, but it can be used for mass surveillance. And as as democratic countries with a shared set of values, we need to you know, build on those values and make sure when we approach AI, we are doing it in a way that serves society. And that means making sure AI doesn't have bias, that we build and test it for safety. We make sure that there is human agency, that it's ultimately accountable to people. You know, about 18 months ago, we published a set of principles under which we would develop AI as Google. Mm -hmm. But it's been very encouraging to see the European Commission has identified AI and sustainability as their you know, top priorities. Mm -hmm. And it's in, US put out a set of principles last week. And be it the OECD or G20, they're talking about this, which I think is very, very encouraging. And I think we need a common framework by which we approach AI. Are you, are you satisfied with those frameworks you said? which have been developed until now. I mean, you refer to the OECD framework, G20 framework. It's an early start. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm very encouraged that they are, they have a lot of commonality, and that's because they are rooted in common yeah. human values. So I think it's a great start, but we need to get more specific and, and evolve it significantly. Uh, I think the European Commission is working on, yeah. Uh, you know, a white paper yeah. around AI, and uh, I think that's an important first step, and we all need to engage. As a company, we are committed to engaging in the process, but it's going to need everyone from around the world. AI is no different from climate. You know, no. you can't get safety by just having one country or a set of countries uh, working on it. You know, you need a global framework uh, to arrive at a safer world there. But Sunda, you, you emphasize a global framework now, um, the question is, how much is actually China engaged into those efforts? And don't you see the danger of the two who are circles and um, that at the end we end up with two different frameworks? One which is more uh, coming out of Beijing and one which is developed uh, inside the OECD um, uh, concept. Um you know, I think there is, uh, there is concern that we could, you know, uh, bifurcate here. Uh, but I think it's important not to do so. I'm optimistic because just like in climate, I think there's more alignment. You know, we have things like the Paris Agreement. The world comes together because everyone shares uh, the climate uh, in which the Earth, uh, you know, how it affects the Earth. And so I think that's true for AI. So down the line, I think there'll be, there'll be 
a common gravitational pull, uh, regardless of who you are, to try and converge. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to achieve peace and prosperity. So I think there'll be a, uh, there'll be a gravitational pull. No, we need it. And we actually, it. the forum is it's central for the fourth industrial revolution is trying uh, to, to bring the parties together. Now, I, I, I changed for a moment the subject, and uh, when you look at the GDPR, the California Data Privacy Act, um, regulators start to take meaningful action uh, to protect the consumer privacy and address, uh, I mean, it's a second issue, the, the growing anti -concern, antitrust concerns. Mm -hmm. um, Google buying up all startups which are in the, uh, let's say, AI area and so on. Um, and some believe uh, that uh, actually companies like Google should pay, I think it was called, a digital dividend. Mm -hmm. uh, can you, can you uh, exp uh, um, share with us what, what is actually the policy of, of Google? And I have here two, uh, I, I come back privacy and antitrust? You know, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, first of all, uh, maybe we'll talk about privacy. You know, uh, GDPR has been a great, uh, great uh, 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 template. Um, I think it gives a standardized privacy framework, uh, you know, and often when we are in other countries and when we are, they are thinking about privacy regulation, you know, we point to GDPR as a template. I'm glad Europe took the lead on it. And I think that gives a good framework for all of us to work on. Um, for us, you know, privacy is at the heart of what we do. You know, users come to Google at very important moments, ask us questions. We deal with people's sensitive information in Gmail, Google Photos, and so on. And so we have to earn that trust. And you know, today we do it by giving them control and transparency and choice around it. Mm -hmm. And over time, I think, AI actually allows us to do this better. We can do more for our users. Most of the data today we deal with is to help users with their information needs. And we can do that with less data over time. Um, and it's counterintuitive, but last year, for example, if you use Google's keyboard, we actually now learn uh, what to suggest, but we don't send the raw data back. We only compute our models and the data stays on the phones. So over time, I think we can do more things on device. We can use AI to actually preserve privacy as we improve user experiences. And I do think it should be, it's important that products need to work for everyone. It's a foundational principle. So today, if you take a product like YouTube, we allow users to pay for it and get it in an ad-free basis, or you have an ad-supported product. It's what allows us to take information and provide many services to billions of people around the world. And you know, privacy cannot be a luxury good. We sure, need to so. make sure we develop services in a way that works for everyone, but puts them first and you know, is privacy enhancing. And, and that's the journey we are all on. But ultimately, it's up to users to choose. On your second question, I think with our scale, uh, rightfully comes scrutiny. You're right, we have bought startups, but you know, as a company, we invest every single year in hundreds of startups through our venture arms. We support entrepreneurs and incubators around the world. Uh, you know, through our Grow with Google program, we are trying to digitally skill millions of people. In Europe alone, we have skilled over 5 million Europeans. So with scale comes the chance to work on things, take a long-term view on important technologies like AI and quantum computing. And so you know, that it gives us a chance to do that. But ultimately, you know, we have to do it all in a way that works for society. That's the real test. And society has to judge whether what we are doing is beneficial. And you know, we want to engage constructively in the process and, 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 you know, and earn our right to do that. But we aren't, do, you know, we aren't building up scale for scale's sake. You know, we are trying to do important things for our users.